And good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here on a very stormy day in Nashville, Tennessee. We're going to lighten things up and make it a fun uh, insider's view for you. Our last one of the year, and we brought in a, a, a good friend and someone who is just, uh, just great to be around. Uh, he's the founder of Big Loud Shirt Industries. Craig Wiseman is one of today's most celebrated songwriters. He's had over 300 cuts, 100 singles, 19 number ones, and has had songs on over 80 million records sold. He's also given us the award-winning song, uh, the number one that just won every award in, in the world, Tim McGraw's Live Like You Were Dying. Uh, he was Songwriter of the Year several times, a CMA and ACM Song of the Year, which uh, was, of course, Live Like You Were Dying. In 2009, Craig was honored by NSAI as the Songwriter of the Decade. He's written songs from among people like Faith Hill, Kenny Chesney, Beverly Knight, Roy Orbison, Dolly Parton, Brooks and Dunn, and Toby Keith. Welcome, Craig Wiseman, to the Insider's View. And I just love being with this man because he's so much fun to be around, and he really dressed up for you folks today. Thank you. <laughs> I decided to go open toe today. It's spring. <laughs> Well, you know, uh, a little-known trivia fact about him, uh, and, and, and this is something I learned, uh, he always paints his left big toe, and, 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 and you, there's a special nail polish you have for that, don't you? I, I, I'm, girls, I'm an OPI guy. I'm here for OPI girls. <laughs> yeah. The new, obviously The are. new Katy Perry line is exquisite, by the way. Um, it's not, yeah, just yeah, any, not just any red, right? <laughs> Not just no, no, not just in it. No, it's um, that's the great thing about having a company called. You guys really, life is weird like that. Um, I have a company called Big Loud Shirt. I'm to the point now where if I don't wear a Hawaiian shirt to church, they ask me what's wrong. So <laughs> you can train people. Um, as long as my flip flops and my shirt match, I'm rocking. So. Um, <laughs> But I started painting my toenail. Everybody thinks it's some kind of a party thing. My wife and I met working at church camps. And, um, and one year we were doing a church camp, and it was a total washout. It was raining 24-7. And we were trying to get the kids. It was kind of a younger group. Everybody was 15, boys to one side of the room, girls to the other. And we were trying to get the ice broke. And the girls were over there, you know, doing each other's hair and painting each other's toes. And I told the guys, I was like, let's get the girls to paint our toes. And 15-year-old guys, they were like, no way. I was like, okay, let's just get them to paint one so they don't think we're weird. <laughs> <laughs> so we got the girls to paint our left big toe. And I wore it some through the summer. It started looking scraggly at some point. My wife wiped, wiped it off. We were working that same church camp a year later, and the night before church camp, I thought about it. And I told my wife, I was like, paint my toenail again. And I'm going to tell the guys I kept my toenail painted all year long. And I got there, and two or three of the guys had painted their toenail too. And within five minutes, all the guys had their toenail painted. And I, I was probably... I don't know, man, 12, 13 years ago, and I've kept my toenail painted ever since. It's kind of my crucifix. Um, <laughs> um, and now I have it professionally done. We were, in fact, we were going to Vegas. My wife and I were going to Vegas a few years ago, and Kenny Chesney was throwing a beach party at Mandalay Bay, and my wife was like, would you please go get a pedicure with me? And I was like, no. She was like, your feet look like, look like Frodo Boggins from... <laughs> From, from Lord of the Rings, would you please? And so I went and had a pedicure done, and now I have my toe professionally done always. Thank you very much. Um, uh, you have had such an incredible run as a songwriter here in Nashville, but you know, when you first arrived in town as a drummer, things were not, not always so good for you, were they? Oh, no, it's, it's, it's a dues paying, um, it's a dues paying business, man. I mean, uh, no, I got to town, I came to town and dropped out of college, not that I recommend that. Um, <laughs> dropped out of college and came here when I was 20. Uh, in fact, I had thought I would either go to uh, Belmont or Blair School of Music because that degree would help me on Music Row because this was back before there was really an industry program. I think it was just starting over here. And I got to town and realized that a college degree wasn't really get a matter in what I was doing. And there's a lot of other jobs in the music industry where having a, you know, having a college degree matters like having a college degree, but when it came to being a songwriter and the pure creative stuff, not at all. So um, I started playing drums. 
Uh, I'd been playing drums uh, since the day I graduated high school. I went to Florida with a rock band. All my friends went to Florida on their senior trip, and I went to Florida with a rock band and had my spinal tap summer with a rock band. Um, <laughs> but I started playing um, seven nights a week, six hours a night, uh, for $25 a night up in Madison, at a little place that's still, still there, Smeraldo's. And um, uh, we played there for six months, and then a club in Hendersonville hired us away for six nights a week, $35 a night. So I had a night off and a $10 a week raise, which at that time, I actually could feel that $10. And uh, I got to go to my first songwriter night, and I went over to Douglas Corner, and it was the night that Garth Brooks and his buddies and Tony Arata and those guys and Garth Brooks goes, well, I've got a record deal. I've got a milk crate here if you guys want to drop off some songs. And um, I put a few songs in there and nothing happened, of course. But um, I got to sit there and watch Tony Arata sit beside Garth Brooks and sing the dance. And Garth Brooks up there going, man, somebody should cut that song one day. Somebody should cut that song one day. And Garth ended up cutting it and all that. So... But yeah, so I mean, years of, uh, that's about five years of that. I got lucky and got a Roy Orbison cut, but at the time he was on Virgin and there wasn't any label in town and, and it was just obviously got lucky and didn't really get anything out of that. But by about 1990, I finally got a real publishing deal at a place called Almo Irving, uh, A&M Records um, publishing house. And uh, within a couple of years, Barry Beckett, God rest his soul, um, old um, Muscle Shoals producer. He started hearing some of my stuff and gave me some words of encouragement. And within a few years, things started happening. And I had my first number one in 94. And I managed to have about a number one a year ever since. I've been very, very blessed. What was your first number one? A thing on Tracy Lawrence called it The Good Die Young. Yeah. Uh, it was just this little, just this, I mean, just. It was also a big lesson for me, too, because, you know, when you write, you tend to make things up, you know? And I read a lot. There's a lot of, there's a big difference between reading fiction and nonfiction. You know, nonfiction has to really, really, really be good. And basically, the more real nonfiction feels, the better it does. I'm sorry, the more real fiction if, 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 you, if you'll notice that, I bet, um, in the fiction you read, that it's, it, it could be nonfiction. It's, I mean, sure enough, look, I like science fiction stuff and all that stuff too, but even science fiction stuff, it, it feels real. And me, as a young writer, kind of coming to grips with real, with honest, with, with revealing yourself, and think about, think about every Pulitzer I read voraciously. Every Pulitzer Prize winning book, when you go back through it, almost every Pulitzer Prize winning book is somebody giving a completely unblinking, honest confession of their life. You know, and the weirdest life, some life of living whatever, some East Coast upper class thing or some guy who goes to the Arctic and stares in the eyes of polar bears and all these things that, that, that you can't relate to. It has nothing to do with your life, but because they open up, because they, because they take you on their journey, invariably it reveals some of your journey to you too. And... Man, there, as a writer, there's just something to that. There's something to just opening up and just going, look, man, here it is. This is where I'm at, and this is, this is all I know. And sometimes all I know is nothing. Um, there's something to that. My first number one, after all those years of making stuff up and having fun and doing all that kind of stuff, was um, actually kind of autobiographical the first time my family went to church. My dad was a pilot. We traveled a lot. We got to church one day, and we missed the time change totally and got there an hour early. <laughs> and I went to go play in the woods out back of the church in my new suit and found a vine and started swinging like Tarzan and tore my suit. And my mom was furious. 
And uh, there was a little bit of that autobi autobiography in that song. And that song was the number one. So, um, and at the time, I just sailed right past that. Yeah, whatever, I'm cranking out so much stuff. But I look back now and realize that I revealed myself. I just gave it up. I just told. I wasn't trying to write for those people. I was just trying to write from me. And um, that's, that's, that's. You want to do it? I'll do a little bit of it. Yeah, First yeah. verse. Yeah. Sunday morning, I was seven years old in the backyard playing in a big mud hole. I was all decked out, ready for church. Got my brand new suit all covered in dirt. Mama hit the ceiling, she is about to... Mama hit the ceiling, she is fit to be tied. Talking about how she gonna tan my hide. But daddy was laughing as I changed my clothes, saying, Mama, leave the boy alone. Cause if the good die young, if the good die young, Oh, our little boy's gonna have a lot of fun Cause he's gonna live forever if the good die young um. So, so here you go, you got a big hit and, and, and what's the first thing, did you think, okay, I've figured it out, I'm ready to go now? No, God, no, I was, and you, th then you figure out, then these endless, the, the onion, you know, the, the, the endless peeling the onion thing. Yeah. So I had a big hit, but I'd written it with this guy, Paul Nelson, who was kind of in the Tracy Lawrence camp and all that kind of stuff. And I was just the guy lucky enough to be in the room with Paul. Then, so it was like, everybody's like, yeah, yeah, you got lucky. And I was like, well, yeah, I did get lucky. I got very, very blessed. Um, but then, but then, thank goodness, my second number one, I wrote with another guy that was one of my peers. It was on Leroy Parnell, uh, called Little Bit of You. Um, and then a Diamond Rio thing. And then, and then finally, and then, and then you hit that thing where everybody's like, yeah, well, you got lucky, you got lucky, you got lucky. And I had my second number one, and everybody's like, oh, you're kind of like, you know, you're on this new label. And, uh, and, then, my third, and then my third number one, and yeah, I walk in the room, and everybody's like, oh, you again, you must be used to this stuff. I was like, dude, God, man, <laughs> this shit is hard. So, um, <laughs> I was like, man, ah. So, and now, you know, I mean, I just had, I just had a number one with a Chris Young um, uh, voices. Um, we had a party, I don't know, four or five weeks ago. And everybody now, I mean, it was number 19. God, man. And um, everybody's like, oh, you're just used to it. You're just, it's like, man, cause there's always in this business, there's always enough songs that crash and burn and die horrible deaths in between the number ones to make you really, really appreciate the number ones. Um, but it does freak me out to think you know, about all those number ones you had. Have you ever had a song that surprised you, that uh, you really, you know, either thought was great or was not, or was not so great in your mind, but turned out to be great? Oh, on that side, I think every songwriter, you don't have to do this very long to realize that maybe your favorite song, quite possibly your best work, is going to go to the grave with you. I mean, because you do realize that there's commercial music going on, and, and, and I get that. People are trying to sell records and all that kinds of stuff, and... You know, and that, you know, I am lucky enough to where I, 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 and I consider myself very, very blessed that some of my best work, and I should say that some of the work that has been dearest to me has happened to have coincidentally been well accepted and received. Right. Um, and, and because it's just kind of a, it's just a coincidence. I mean, I, I understand that. It's just a coincidence. Um, you know, so... Yeah, as a surprise, a surprise, my last number one, um, my wife actually has a rock writing credit on it because it was a song that Tim Nichols and I wrote. It was the next song after Live Like You Were Dying. And we were at a casino, of all things, because this casino was talking about hiring our little, what was, what was going to go on to become the hitman, the songwriter group. And we went down to talk to them. And my wife had been invited at our home church to come do the Christmas sermon. And she looked up. And said, and said, I think I have a, uh, I think I have a, I think I know the sermon I'm going to do when we go back to Hattiesburg. She said, it's called A Baby Changes Everything. And I saw Tim's head snap. And I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, I got it. So, um, 
But that song, so Faith, that was the only outside song that Faith put on her Christmas album. She did all these other covers. It was out, what was that, two Christmases ago or whatever, and um, somebody walks to my office and says, congratulations on your number one. And, and Christmas songs, you know, especially nowadays, I mean, there's a lot of songs, seriously. There's some songs that take a year to climb the charts. The charts are so screwed up right now, and so there's just things going on. And somebody said, congratulations on your number one. And I was like, what? And they said, yeah, you've got an AC pop crossover number one, the Faith Hill thing. It entered like at 30 and jumped to four, and it's at number one this week. And it was like, and you know how, man, that just doesn't happen. I mean, that was absolutely like, are you kidding me? And so, um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, yeah, that was a complete... Give us the first verse of it. Let's hear the first verse. Oh, my gosh. Do um, yeah, you can do that. Much too young, unprepared for what's to come. A baby changes everything. Not a ring on her hand. All her dreams, all her plans. Baby changes everything. The man she loves, she's never touched. How will she keep his trust? The baby changes everything. The baby changes everything. She cries. It's a long, but it's just. I sprung that on you. That really wasn't fair. But. It was no, no. It was it was a, it was fun to write that song because. You know, there's a big church thing. Like, well, what if Jesus were to walk down the main aisle today? Would you go with him to heaven? I'm like, what? What are you talking about? I mean, I... <laughs> and, um, but it is kind of one of those things of taking, of, t of taking Christ's birth thing and just... And I wanted to write that song to where, where you just lay out the facts, you know, um, and just lay out the lyrics and lay out the merry thing without, without all the other stuff going on. And... It kind of tricks you into like going, like teenage girl much too young and forever what's to come. Baby changes everything. Not a ring on her hand. Uh, and then, man, she loves. She's never touched. Tell her she earns her trust. But, and you kind of start thinking, well, that little hope. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean. Uh, and then, you know, and then she can feel it's coming soon, but, but there's no place, there's no room. A baby changes everything. Um, she has to go far away. Heaven knows she can't stay. A baby changes everything. And up until that point, it almost seems like this is a teenage girl who has to go somewhere to go stay with her aunt and have this baby and wait for the rumors to die down. And then... And then a choir of angels sing, glory to a newborn king. A baby changes everything. Um, and then the last verse, um, which I like. We, so you get to this huge thing, and I was kind of uncomfortable with this. And I was actually the first time I ever did hallelujah in a song where it changes from the she cried. And it, hallelujah. It still gives me chills to do that part. And, um, I, I, I was always kind of looking at sermons like, well, hallelujah, that's, that's corny to put that in a song, but when you put it in there in the right place and you do it, and it just, it still gives me chills. And then it got to the last verse of, um, when 
the last verse after all that stuff and angels and stars and shepherds all gather around and, um, and then it breaks down with that last little my whole life was turned around I was lost but now I'm found a baby changes everything Baby changes everything. Wow, yeah. Awesome. How does, how does it feel for you to know how your songs have affected people? Not just that song, but, but other songs, like Live Like You Were Dying, like Believe, and, and these other songs that you've written. You know, it's really weird. I kind of got on this tear. I mean, I did years of just, I mean, to be a successful songwriter, and I, I kid you not, man, I mean, it, it's, it's work. I mean, it's like, it's like mastering any instrument. You close yourself in a room for years, you know, and you, I just lost in the joy of it. I mean, I love it. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. Don't, it's not like some burden or something. It's, um, it's, it's what God put me here to do, but, um, but you do, I mean, you just kind of get in your room and you're just sort of working and just, just lost in that. And years go by, man, a decade goes by. I mean, it just races and you're just lost in this bliss. And I kind of started with the Good Die Young and that was probably a very good indicative song about this. Up to, I was the up-tempo guy for years because country was finally kind of coming out of that thing in the late 80s when I got here, it was... 40-year-old A&R people looking yeah. for songs for 50-year-olds, and I'm walking around like, going, dude. <laughs> and everybody's shocked that they only sell 40,000 records. Are you kidding me? <laughs> so finally in 90, and I was a part of that wave. All of a sudden this new, the, this contemporary stuff or whatever came and all this in the Brooks and Dunn and the Vince Gill and just all this. It was just more of what it should be. It was just this music and and it's people that were, grew up listening to everything, and so therefore what they're doing kind of reflects everything. And I love now, I mean, you hear hip hop starting to kind of creep in <laughs> to country, man. It's cool, man, man Jason Aldean's latest single is great. And, and the single of the last before that, She's Country. <laughs> Freaking speed metal, man, I love that. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, um, you know, um, but that's just it. So, so you're lost in that, and um, and then I started slowing down and up and wrote songs like the good stuff, and um, and then of course look like you were down and believe, and and yeah, I mean when you have a 300 pound backhoe operator guy come up to you with tears in his eyes, trying to talk to you about his emotions. And you can tell this is probably the first time in his life he's ever tried to talk to somebody on an emotional level. And, and, and they do a horrible job of it. And they don't have to, man, just to look in their eyes. And they come up to you and just tell you that, that, that they lost their father or their father got sick or, or whatever, however they attach to that song. And they come up to you with all that emotion in their eyes and they, and they, and they, they thank you and they want to shake your hand. It's, 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 it is, that, that is the ball game of that, of just, because the whole, because look, before all the nice cars and stuff and, and the professionally done tow, um, <laughs> before all that, you wrote songs just because you wanted to, I mean, I just want to, I want to write a song and just, and other people like it. You know, the idea of somebody singing your song, anybody, one person singing your song is just nuts. And it just takes you back to that core thing of, um, of people just embracing your song, embracing, embracing something you do. Because look, because people are busy, man. You got a lot of stuff going on. Somebody takes time out to put that song in their head and in their heart. It's, that's, that's ball game. That's it. And I kind of, I had, I had kind of forgotten that. Not really forgotten that. I was just lost in it, not thinking about it. Because you can't think about that shit. You, you can't think. You can't, you can't, you can't. You, here's something I tell young writers. Okay? Go to the Bible. First story in the Bible with people is, is, is Adam and Eve, right? So, so think about this. 
They're naked. They're running around the Garden of Eden. Woo, it's all great. They're loving it. Okay, then serpent tree, yada, yada, yada. They eat the apple from the tree of life. God told them not to do it. What happens to them? And it wasn't even, and the way I like it was, it wasn't even, I mean, God just told them not to do it. So it wasn't even like it was a sin, sort of. I mean, there's some people that like to say it's a sin. Maybe it is sort of, sort of a sin. But the consequence of that, it wasn't, it wasn't something. Think about the Old Testament. The consequences of Old Testament stuff are lightning and armies being killed and dashed against walls and stuff like that and drowned in rivers and seas. The consequence of that was just self-awareness. That's all. That's all. Man. All of a sudden, they were aware they were naked. They were aware they were less than. They were aware of all this stuff. The context of that, I think, is very, very important. That should sort of tell you. My, my wife likes to watch those Real Housewives shows. <laughs> and the... Orange County in particular and everything, we all see with this pool where there's such heightened sense of self-awareness. Uh, not to get on to L.A. or anything, because, because it's, it's, it's human nature. But any place where there's such a heightened sense of self-awareness, people generally start describing those places and those people in really, really unattractive words that if I weren't in a Baptist college, I'd say right now. But some of them start with an A, and some of them start with a B. And, um, <laughs> and I'm telling you right now, as a writer, I think it's every person's job to run butt naked through the woods, basically. to forget all that stuff, to turn off the self-awareness thing. I mean, who are the most interesting people you know? The most interesting people, the most fascinating people you know are the people that don't have the faintest idea how they're coming off. Is that right? People that are just like going. They are just going, and you just want to be around to watch them go. <laughs> Is that right? You know why? Because... They're back in that place, man. They're in Eden. They're where God would have us be were it not for our own crap. As a writer, get, get your butt uncovered and get it in the woods. Don't look around. Don't worry about how things are coming off. Don't you dare write a friggin' line and step back and look at it and wonder how well it's going to be received. You will, your skills as a critic will develop at such a faster pace than your skills as a writer that if you let that critic at the table, it will be the 800-pound gorilla in the room for the rest of your life. Word. Turn that crap off and just, especially at your age, just go, man. Just friggin' go. Burn. Incandescent. Go. Flame on, see you later, check in with you in a few years. And I guarantee you, if you'll take that chance and step out there, run around naked for a little bit, all of a sudden, all this stuff that has been completely ignored, all of a sudden, you'll do something that people will be going like, oh, wow. And that happened to me time and time again. My whole career as a writer was... I was trying to write all the stuff that Nashville would like, and it was horrible. Once again, country music was really, really bad back then. I mean, it was bad. Um, um, and I would go along, and I, so I was here for a few years trying to write this radio stuff, like whatever that means. I was trying to imitate stuff that I didn't like. Why in the world would I do that? Why would any artist do that? So... I reached that point after you're here two or three years, man. It's really tough. I was making $25 a night. I was wearing $6 shoes. I couldn't afford to have a flat tire. Um, that I went, here, I'm just going to write what I want to write. And I'll never forget, 
I was studying the craft and all this stuff, and I had a girlfriend, and she left her wallet on the table one day, and her driver's license was there, and it was like, hey, you've got a first name. She went by her middle name. Well, your first name's Ellen. And she's like, oh, I hate Ellen. I hate, my mother calls me Ellen. I don't go by Ellen. I'm like, okay, so I was like, okay, I'm going to write a song called Ellen, and I'm going <laughs> to say Ellen as many times as I can at it. <laughs> and that was all. That was, that was it. I just wanted to write. Uh, Ellen, I'm going to need a Ellen, Ellen. It was just one of those screaming, stupid songs. <laughs> all of a sudden, I played it for this guy who was listening to some of my songs for Chris Oglesby, and they were just like, oh, man, I love that song. And I was just like... <laughs> Well, what about that one where I cut off my grandmother and everybody and they're like, I don't know. What a great little lesson. Oh, there I was in the middle of all these songs I was working on all night long. I sat down for 15 minutes and turned all that crap off, managed to get some clothes off of me and go running through the woods and not worry about nothing outside of making me smile, outside of being lost in that moment. And that, and there's still some of my old publishers. You go ask Scott Gunner and Chris Oglesby you say Ellen to him, and they'll go, Craig Wiseman. <laughs> it was a stupid little song. And, and then, so I started, I, so I went to that place and just started making crap up and just having fun. And nobody knew what to do with it, but it got me a deal. But then I got over to Alamo, to this place, and there's these Kent Robbins walking around, and Mike Reed, for God's sake, man, and, and oh my God, these serious, serious dudes, man, guys that had 19 number ones. Well, who likes those guys? Anyway, so, and I tricked back into it, man. I started trying to write this crap again. And I was there for about a year, and I hated my stuff, and they hated my stuff, and I could tell, standard thing back then was they'd sign you for a couple of years, and then they'd drop you. And after a year, I could tell I was on the way out the door, and I just decided, listen, I got a demo budget. I'm going to I'm going to write some songs that I like. I got one year. I got about three or four demo sessions, and that's all I'm going to focus on is just a year and just these songs that I want to hear. And I just started writing songs that I wanted to hear. And my house got broken. It was a really low time in my life. My house got broken in two, and all my stuff, my Roy Orbison money had finally bought me a TV and a stereo, and all that stuff got stolen. And... Um, the insurance didn't want to pay me, and I finally got a little bit of a check, and I spent that check on a Fostex 8-track system, mm -hmm. quarter-inch. I didn't have a TV. I didn't have anything. I put a drum stool down there, and all I did was just work and not worry about anything. I was going to lose my deal. My house had gotten broken into. It was tough. Man. I didn't get to go home that Christmas because my pipe froze in my house. And... And I was there because the water thawed, and the water, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was the low point. It was the, hard, it was the hard point for me. And I just worked and worked and worked and literally wore the ass out of a robe that I had. <laughs> I, had, I, had I had this black, my mother had bought me this black velour robe. And I was just... On, that, on my little drum stool at my Fostex so much that one day I hung my robe up on a door and I looked at it and realized that velour, it turns out, is like just this little stuff that's poked in like this mesh. It's just like, you know, there's like, like a thousand of them in a square inch. And I realized it was hanging on this door and I realized I'd worn it so much that all that had gone away. So right over my butt part, it was just see-through kind of pantyhose material. <laughs> And all I could think about was all the times the pizza guy had brought my pizza and I turned away from the door. Like, man, I think the pizza guy thinks I was probably hitting on him or something. Like, man, oh. So that was part of the thing. That contributed to the low part of my life in a lot of ways. And, um, and yeah, and so I just turned it off, man. I went inward and was just like, man, this is me. And I started doing these little weird things. And, and uh, thank God, Barry, uh, David Conrad played Barry Beckett some of my stuff, just going, listen, I'm not pitching you songs, but I got this weird over here we're going to drop. And here's some of his music. And 
Barry Beckett called me at my house. And, and it was like, Craig, this is Barry Beckett. And I was like, I thought it was one of my friends messing with me. Because Barry Beckett was a legend. I mean, he played, he was the producer in Muscle Shoals, and he did Paul Simon. That's him playing piano, old time rock and roll. I mean, this guy was, and this guy I heard about, because he was, he did rock and roll. So I knew Barry Beckett. I knew his records. Heck, I own a bunch of stuff that he played and produced. And he called me just to go, man, he goes, dude, it's heading your way. He said, don't, don't stop. Don't stop. It's heading your way. Trust me. And I was like, and I, I remember I hung up the phone and went downstairs in my sexy robe. And um, I think I worked for two and a half days. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't go to sleep for two and a half days. It was Sunday afternoon. And I think I went to sleep Tuesday night. And... Um, and within three or four months, he found a band called Confederate Railroad. And I had two songs on their first triple platinum record. And um, that kind of took care of business a little bit, some money coming in. And, um, and the next, and Atlantic, so it, they were on Atlantic, as was Tracy Lawrence. So Atlantic kind of heard some of my stuff. And next thing you know, Tracy Lawrence, and one thing led to another. But all that came from me. Yeah, just, I mean, you can't outguess what people are going to, I mean, you know, you can't, uh, you can't, yeah. Well, there's so many artists that have recorded your songs. Uh, we talked about Kenny Chesney, uh, Brooks and Dunn, Leanne Rimes, Tim McGraw, Blake Shelton, Trace Adkins, uh, Phil Vassar. Um, the Good Stuff, uh, which was a, a big hit for Kenny Chesney. Tell me about that song. The good stuff, talking about being real, was um, I was writing for RCA, for BMG at the time, and I was a little late, which meant it was a typical day. Um, it was a Friday, I was a little late, and my co-writer, I had just started writing for RCA, and their door guard, a guy named Rusty, he's security at ASCAP now. Um, um, I had been there for about three months, and they said, oh, Rusty, he's from Mississippi, too. I'm from Hattiesburg, Mississippi, originally. I started, and I'm just getting little bits and pieces of a story, like, what brought you up here? He goes, well, my wife was sick, and she was at Vanderbilt, so I started coming up here, and I retired from the Mississippi High Patrol, and I slowly got in this thing that his wife had gotten cancer, and through him coming up here and just being with her, and he did the whole thing when she lost her hair through chemo. He shaved his head and all that, and just came up here for the long battle, and he'd lost his wife about a year and a half before that. And um, so the day I got there, I'd been late enough to where my co-writer, Jim Collins, had talked to him. Jim was smoking a cigar out front, and he came out front with him and got his whole story. And when we sat down, he goes, man, did you know Rusty's story? And I was like, yeah, I just, I've just been kind of getting bits and pieces. And Jim filled in a few pieces for me, and I filled in a few pieces for him. And Jim had been married for about 10 or 12 years, and I'd been married about seven or eight at that point. And we both sat there just going, man, the idea of just that, of just watching your wife. I mean, we were just, and Jim was like, well, I got this idea. He goes, you know, maybe we can do this. And he's from Texas. He goes, maybe we can. This little Western swing thing. He's like, you know, something. We just do this. And he just said, like, you know, yeah, I want to get some of the good stuff. And I want to see this. And I want to. And I was just like, man, you know. And I just kind of sat there and started, and this song started coming out. And there was a couple times when I was, <laughs> there was a couple times I started crying when it just kind of came through. People always say, man, I cried the first time I heard that song. And I was like, yeah, me too. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, um, we always said that that, that was a song was, um, was, this song came from three happy marriages, and two of them were still going. Wow. So, um, but it, what, it wasn't Jim's story. I mean, it wasn't Rusty's story at all. It was a total fictional thing. It was just from that place of, um, of that. So, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. yeah.
Me and my lady had a first big fight, so we drove around till I saw the neon lights of a corner bar. And it just seemed right, so I pulled up. Not a soul around but the old barkeep down at the end looking half asleep. He walked up and said, What'll it be? I said the good stuff. He didn't reach around for the whiskey. He didn't pour me a beer. His blue eyes kind of went misty. He said, you can't find that here. Cause it's the first long kiss on the second date. Mama's all worried when you get home late and drop and ring the spaghetti plate. Cause your hands are shaking so much. It's the way that she looked with the rice in her hair Eating burnt supper the whole first year And asking for second to keep her from tearing up Yes, honey, that's the good stuff He grabbed a card and the milk and he poured a glass I smiled and said, man, I'll have some of that And we sat there and talked the hours passed, just like an old friend. I saw a black and white picture and it caught my stare. It was a pretty girl with bouffant hair. And he said, yeah, man, that's my body. Took him about a year after we went. He said, I spent five years in a bottle when the cancer took it from me. It's a new t-shirt saying I'm a grandpa And being right there as the time got small And holding her hand when the good Lord called her up Yeah, man, that's the good stuff He said, when you get home, she'll start to cry When she says, I'm sorry, say so am I Look into those eyes so deep in love and drink it up cause that's the good stuff. I want to get to live I, I like you were dying. I had to edit that down a little bit, getting a little emotional. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but but that song, I'll never forget my Mary, my wife, and we ran out to our car and all that stuff, and it had been crazy. I'll never forget. And we got her in the passenger side, I got in the driver's side, and we closed the door, and everybody was around the car screaming. But it was quiet for the first time in hours, and she was leaning over at me. And the sound of the rice falling out of her hair and hitting the console in between us, that plastic, that little tick, tick, tick. It was just. So, so, yeah, that song was largely fiction, but, you know, but no, it was, there's every little snapshot in it. Um, I have to ask you about Live Like You Were Dying, because I want, I want us to hear that before everybody goes. How did that happen? Look, you're dying. Man, that was just, that song just kind of came through um, Tim Nichols and I got together to write, and uh, funny, I was, I had just, I had been over at BMG, I had just opened my company, but we had a friend of ours, a guy that was like 30 and had uh -huh. a couple of babies and stuff, and he got, he got one of those things, he went in for a physical, they, they shot a picture of his lungs, and we're like, oh my God, you've got this mass on your lungs, and he was one of these kind of a hypochondriac guys anyway, really high strung. And, oh, my God, you know, he was freaking out. And they sent him to an oncologist and all that stuff. And he went through, you can imagine, two weeks of just, he just had a new baby. He had, like, a two-year-old and a new baby. And finally, somebody looked at it and said, dude, this is what they call whatever. There's, when you're a baby, there's this, when you're born, there's literally, there's this, this stuff that holds your lungs against your rib cage, and it's supposed to dissolve. And in some people, it doesn't dissolve all the way. And that's all that is. And, you know, 
You're not going to die, and if you do die, that's not going to be what kills you. So, but, you know, amongst the songwriter community, I mean, we all had heard about it, and so Tim had said something about him, and we were talking about how weird would that be just all of a sudden, boom, dude. And we just started talking about all kinds of stuff. Tim talked about a couple of friends of his that had misdiagnosis. I had an uncle who'd gotten some weird little strain of leukemia, had to go to Mayo Clinic to even get it diagnosed. <clears throat> but it turned out to be very, very treatable. But from his hospital bed, the Mayo Clinic, he called and retired from his job. He was a very high-tech guy, his consultant thing in the Defense Department. But he called and retired from his job and booked a shark dive in Belize from his hospital bed. And, and we started just talking about that. The, <clears throat> to respond to something like that as opposed to as opposed to just, oh my God, letting that fear and the unknown run your life in that situation, to responding to it by a call to action, by, and so that was it. I mean, we had that thing, and we were like, man, there should be a song in that. And I was like, man, you know, like, dying to live, we just started throwing stuff back and forth, and I mumbled, like, live like you were dying, and Tim goes, yeah, that's it. And I was like, okay, all right, because we really, we just played that for like a minute, a back and forth, and I was like, live like you were dying, he's like, yeah. And I literally grabbed my guitar and just went, Sky diving on a Rocky Mountain climbing. And I, and I love deeper. I was like, oh man, there's this chord. There's this chord, dude. There's just this. this no, there's this. There's this chord. There's love deep down. Yeah, that's just blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Whatever that chord is, that's the chord. That's it, yeah, that was. And I, yeah, I was yeah, a little like you were dying. And we, and the first verse almost came out. The first verse just, just came out, and 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 I said, dude, in the chorus, and I remember we were there, and I was like, dude, I was like, we need in the middle of the chorus, I was like, it's gonna get too, sound like a Hallmark card, but that, no, it's got love, and I'm like, I climb that one. I was like, we need one of those. I was like, like a rodeo thing, I like like. Like, I was like, horses have weird names. Let's do like a weird horse name. And he was looking at me like I had three heads. I was like, no. I was like, no. I was like, bulls. Bulls have wild names. We need a bull name. <laughs> and he was looking at me like, oh, what? And I was like, I was like, just in the middle of that chorus, I was like, we just need a weird, we need a weird in the middle of that chorus, or it's just going to be Hallmark, dude. It's going to be, it's just so, ugh. And so all of a sudden it was like, man, we just need, and we, and all of a sudden that Fu Manchu thing. And I said, man, I said that, that live like you were dying. I was like, that line, that's going to be a serious line in this song. And anyway, so like he, we had started that late that day. He had to go like take his kids to soccer and he had to go. And I was like, let's just get together next week and finish it. And we ended up, I ended up calling him that night. And I'll never forget, I went into my living room in pitch black and laid on the floor and we wrote the second verse on the phone. And that was like on a Thursday or Friday, and I demoed it Monday. And the girl in my office had told Missy, Tim McGraw's well, part of the production team, that there was a song going on. She met me in the parking lot and wanted it. Um, and that song just... It's history. That song just... That song always was just on its... I mean, that we just never... We, that, with that song, you just, if you could just stay out of its way... And, and well, now, right now, I mean, I was at a wedding two weeks ago. We were at a wedding, and they said there's some TV show this fall that's going to be, there's something, something's going to be going on with that song. I'm just like, well, wow. of course. It's a worship campaign that's been done, and the, uh, Doug Slayball, the guy who's behind, the, kind of the CEO behind Saddleback Church, he was the guy who, who was responsible for Purpose Driven Life. He was the guy that could see, Rick, you've got some sermons here, you've got some lessons here, you've you got a book due here. Why don't you put all that together? 
And so after he left Saddleback, he came to me, and we've got a worship campaign for Live Like You Were Dying, which is great, and it's, about, it's five weeks long. And there's been uh, hundreds of churches that have, uh, that have done it. Um, um, if you go to uh, uh, LLYWD or whatever, whatever that would be, whatever the acronym would be, but there, there's a worship campaign that's just really, really great. And churches have, I've gone to several churches, People's Church and Franklin, there's several churches around here who have done it, and um, yeah, so the, the so the ability of that song to touch lives is just beyond um, beyond. Well, your ability to touch all our lives has been incredible. I, we could go on for hours because Greg Wiseman is just a wonderful storyteller. He's a wonderful inspiration, and certainly uh, great to have him here as our guest for the Insider's View. Thank you, Greg Wiseman. Thank you. This has been a production of the Mike Curb College of Entertainment and Music Business at Belmont University and Nashville Public Television.